Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Tanya Fancher. I am a professor of internal medicine at UC Davis and the director of our Center for a Diverse Healthcare Workforce. I'm here with Charlene Green. Oh, come on <laughs> But Dr. Charlene Green, come on over. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Charlene Green. I'm director of outreach, recruitment, and retention at UC Davis School of Medicine. So we're here to welcome you to the admissions revolution. And um, Charlene will tell you a little bit about how we got here, but let me tell you a little bit about our center. So we started six years ago now with this idea that we could bring together a group of incredible researchers, partners from across the country to, 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 uh, to really look deeply into workforce diversity. And as you might not be surprised, um, it was very difficult, and it was quite difficult to get um, buy-in and interest. And incredibly, over the six years, that has really changed. And we are so proud to, to, um, to be here with all of you to really now start to enact the pieces that have been waiting in the wings to be enacted. So let me welcome you, and um, I'm gonna ask Charlene to tell you a little bit more about why we're focusing on admissions today. Um, thank you all again for joining us. So this have, event has been a long time coming, long overdue uh, related to the global pandemic. Um, and this concept actually started Dr. Mark Henderson, who you'll hear from a little later. Um, we were on a plane together, and we really wanted to pull together other health education colleagues um, to really help us disrupt the system. Um, and here we are. So we truly uh, wanted to do this event in person and in connection with the Beyond Flexner Alliance uh, conference because we know how impactful and passionate the patrons of this conference are. So we are here, um, and I'm so grateful to be with colleagues and friends uh, who are engaged in this work with us. Um, the UC Davis Center for a Diverse Healthcare Workforce has um, continuously worked to bring collaborators together to be this incubator for uh, innovation, um, for ideas, to really change the healthcare workforce. Uh, some of our center-supported researchers you'll hear from today, uh, Dr. Dawan Boatwright, Dr. Lisa Meeks, uh, Dr. Ephraim Talamantes, um, and I can tell you that you are all here for in for a treat today. I'd also like to acknowledge our incredible funders, HRSA, the AMA, Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, and our partners, uh, George Washington University of, um, and Fitzmullen Institute, California Primary Care Association, Oregon Health and Science University, Washington State University, um, our other HRSA academic unit, uh, primary care and training enhancement fellow awardee, Rural Prep is uh, represented by Davis Patterson today. So again, thank you all. We hope you really enjoyed today. Um, I also wanted to point out that you, this uh, will be recorded. So if there's a session that you'd like to attend that you're not able to, you'll be able to access the, that session later on on our YouTube page. So check the back of your programs. And I also want to just acknowledge our Jane Conception. She, our Jane Conception is our conference coordinator. She keeps all of us glued together, um, and she really just keeps us all in line. So thank you, Ara. And now I'd like to actually bring to the stage um, our first speaker, Dr. Dowman Boatwright, who will talk about uh, diversity in academic medicine, the present state, and future challenges. Um, and then just a recap, you have these lovely printed programs, right? This is a new thing now that we're back in person, actual paper. So please refer to this uh, throughout um, our afternoon together um, to see some of the workshops that we have. Thank you all and welcome. Can I make and then uh, just to plug that this is the beginning yes. and that we look forward to continuing to work with all of you as we go forward. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dowen Boatwright and I just want to say it's phenomenal to be here seeing you all in person. And today I just wanted to discuss the state of diversity in academic medicine with a focus on medical education. In particular, speaking not only about the current state of diversity that we now see in academic medicine, but also key events historically that have influenced the diversity we now see, and also to discuss some future challenges. But before we do, I do want to spend just a few brief moments talking about why diversity is important. I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but I do want to go over some of the more fundamental arguments supporting diversity in the healthcare workforce. And one of the first is the economic argument. 
I think this is one of the first arguments for diversity um, in teams and one of the more commonly cited arguments. In particular, this is data taken from a very famous paper from the Kinsey Quarterly in 2012 that actually looked at publicly traded companies in France, Germany, the United Kingdom, and the United States, and actually stratified those public companies by the gender and ethnic diversity of their governing boards. And when they stratified those companies into quartiles, they found that without fail, in every single case in each country, the more diverse companies were the most profitable companies. The conclusions that the investigators drew from this study was that a multicultural team promotes creativity and innovation, and that diverse teams were better able to problem solve, especially in rapidly changing and dynamic environments, just as the environment of business, or in our case, the healthcare environment. Nevertheless, as we are all healthcare providers here, I think while we all know that having margins are important to support our mission, we have more noble uh, goals as well, in particular patient care. And I think it's important for us to also reflect on the benefits of diversity to the care we give our patients. And in particular, from a study published in JAMA Internal Medicine in 2014, um, investigators used the Medical Expenditure Panel, which is a very comprehensive database of healthcare utilization in this country, and looked at the role in particular of physicians of color. And what they found was that physicians of color care for over 50% of patients of color, and also about 70% of non-English speaking patients. In addition, physicians of color were significantly more likely to care for patients from low socioeconomic status backgrounds, and also more likely to care for patients reporting Medicaid to be their um, insurance. Again, the authors concluded that physicians of color are integral to providing healthcare access in this country. But not only are we healthcare providers, we're also educators. And in this survey of 600 medical students from Stanford and Harvard, when students were surveyed about the benefits of diversity in their educational environment, 84% stated that the diversity of their uh, medical school class enhanced classroom discussions. 77% said the diversity of their class increased their understanding of various treatment options available to patients. 86% said the diversity gave them access to alternative viewpoints. And 94% said that overall, the diversity enhanced the overall educational experience. And one of my favorite studies, um, Dr. Sam Saha, actually used data from the Association of American Medical Colleges to explore how the diversity of um, the uh, academic learning environment actually influenced, in particular, influenced white medical students. So essentially what he did was he looked at the response of, of white medical students to the graduation questionnaire uh, that the AAMC used to survey all medical students annually, and looked to see how the diversity of that class influenced uh, white medical students self-rating on their ability to care for people from different backgrounds than their own, and also influence their um, attitudes, it's in particular their belief that healthcare was a right for everyone. And what uh, they, the investigators found was that as the diversity of the classroom increased, medical students, in particular white medical students, were more likely to say that they felt more confident providing care for people from different backgrounds than their own, and also were more likely to state that healthcare is a right that everyone should be entitled to. And the investigators concluded from this data that having a diverse learning environment was um, allowed academic medical centers to train and cultivate more thoughtful, open-minded, and humanistic medical students. And this is one of my favorite studies because I think oftentimes when we think about diversity in healthcare workforce, I think we think about the benefits to certain groups, but I think this study shows that, health, uh, that diversity benefits everyone, that it's a team benefit, um, and that the benefits of diversity will benefit everyone on, in the community and our patients. But not only are we educators, we're also scientists. And there have been several studies that also show that diverse scientific teams produce higher quality science. In particular, um, two papers, one from the um, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science and one from the Journal of Labor and Health Economics, showed that when they looked at investigative teams based on gender diversity and also ethnic diversity, the more diverse teams generally publish papers in higher prestige journals as rated by impact factor, and the publications that they um, the manuscripts they published generally were cited more often than more homogeneous teams. Again, the authors concluding that diverse teams are better able um, to create innovative science and higher quality science. And the last argument is just the social justice argument. This is actually my favorite argument, just that all individuals, irrespective of their identity and their background, should be entitled to an education in uh, medicine and also be able to thrive in that learning environment as well. And I think this brings us to the state of diversity in the healthcare workforce at this point. And this is just a figure taken from a, a paper published in 2015 that looked at the compositional diversity of the United States and contrasted that with every phase of medical education 
including um, also independent practitioners. Um, stratified based on physician sex and also um, race ethnicity. And what you can see is what we already know, that when we look at the United States, there's a significant disparity both in terms of the practitioners and the, the learners in medicine based on sex and race ethnicity. Of particular importance, though, is that this disparity increases with each stage of medical training and practice. And I think that's important because I think often when people think about the lack of diversity in the healthcare workforce, we often think of reasons that are extrinsic um, to medicine. And there are reasons extrinsic to medicine, such as structural racism, mass incarceration, and so forth. But I think this figure is excellent in the fact that it also illustrates that there are structural problems in the house of medicine as well. But we didn't reach this stage overnight, and there have been significant changes in the degree of diversity over time. In 1970, less than 10% of all medical students were women, and less than 3% were cl um, classified as underrepresented minorities or black, Hispanic, Latinx, or Native American. And the majority of the underrepresented um, in medicine uh, medical students were trained at historically black medical colleges as well. And as you can see over time, there's been tremendous growth in diversity, in particular diversity based on gender, and more modest um, increases in diversity based on race ethnicity. I think it's important to reflect on some of the national initiatives that have been important um, that have kind of spurned and generated some of the diversity that we see. And to do that, I just want to spend a little bit of time reflecting on this figure. I'm taken from a very famous article in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1994 uh, by the black um, psychiatrist, Dr. Herbert Nickens. And in particular, he graphed, looking specifically at race ethnicity, the diversity of the um, United States population over time, and then also stratified the diversity of matriculants to medical school, again, focusing on matriculants that were underrepresented in medicine. And I think it's important to note that over time, you can see that you, in every single phase that Dr. Nickens described here in phase one, phase two, and phase three, the diversity of the United States population increased. But we see very different behavioral trends in the diversity of medical school matriculants. In particular, in phase one, you can see a significant gain in the diversity from about 3% of all medical school matriculants being underrepresented in medicine to almost 10% by 1974. And Dr. Nickens attributed this to the civil rights movement and an area of social, a period of social activism. However, phase two in particular is marked by something interesting in a period of stagnation. Even though you can see the United States population becoming more diverse, the diversity of medical school matriculants didn't change over this time period. And Dr. Nickens attributed this to backlash to policies and practices to support affirmative action, in particular, secondary to uh, several high profile Supreme Court cases challenging affirmative action. Of note, though, it is important to remember that in each of those Supreme Court challenges, the use of race as at least a factor in admissions for undergraduate school and higher education as well was upheld. But again, this period of stagnation continued until phase three. And phase three was marked by Dr. Nickens' own Project 3000 by 2000, a very ambitious project that Dr. Nickens spearheaded in um, collaboration with the Association of American Medical Colleges to actually have a national and comprehensive strategy to have 3,000 underrepresented matriculants by the year 2000 to medical school. And while Dr. Nickens ultimately was not successful in reaching 3,000, we can see another period of very impressive gains in diversity. However, something curious happened after that, again, often um, brought on by several Supreme Court challenges to affirmative action. We didn't actually see a period of continued growth or even stagnation, but we began to see declines in the level of diversity among those underrepresented in medicine. And that decline continued until the Liaison Committee on Medical Education began to exert more influence on the practices and policies of medical schools related to matriculation and diversity. In particular, in 2009, the LCMA released two diversity accreditation standards. And I don't want to belabor you with the, all the language except to focus on the word must that was included in both standards, such that now if medical schools did not have policies and practices to promote the recruitment and retention of those diverse in medicine, those schools could be cited by the LCME and lose their accreditation. And when we actually sought to examine how these accreditation policies actually influence diversity, we did a study looking at the matriculants to medical school based on gender and race ethnicity during a period before the accreditation standards were released and then subsequently after. And for women matriculants, you can see just as the prior figure showed, from 2003 to 2009, the percentage of women matriculants to medical school steadily declined. Up until 2009, again, when the diversity standards were introduced, and that decline continued, although at a slower rate, and then just two years after the accreditation standards were introduced, 
the trend starkly reversed and the percentage of women matriculants began to increase um, on an annual basis to the point that by 2018, women actually represented the majority of matriculants to medical school. We see a similar trend for black matriculants, but again, on a much smaller scale, such that again, from 2003 to 2009, the percentage of black matriculants to medical school declined on an annual basis. When the accreditation standards were introduced, we see a plateau of that decline and then a reversal by 2011. For Hispanic Latinx matriculants, the percentage of uh, matriculants was actually increasing even before the accreditation standards were introduced, but that rate of increase almost doubled after the standards were introduced by 2011. And then for white matriculants, you can see that by 2011, the percentage of white matriculants declined from about 68% on average in the years before to about 58%. Uh, such that in 2018, um, the AAMC boasted that for the first time in history, women were both the majority of applicants and matriculants and noted gains in race, ethnicity, and diversity as well. And we've seen that these gains have been persistent. Again, this is just a snapshot from the AMC's website stating that the medical school enrollment for 2021 was the most diverse in history. And these accreditation standards, the ramifications continue such that now the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education um, has also released a diversity accreditation standard with language very closely mirroring the LCME's diversity accreditation standard, such that now for graduate medical education as well, all programs will be held accountable for their degree of diversity recruitment and retention. And I think that brings us to a crossroads, and it's unclear what the future will hold at this point. Will we have a period such as phase three where we continue to see impressive gains in diversity, or a period of stagnation, or even worse, a period of decline? And obviously the future is unknowable, but I think we can use some data, especially from the lived experience of students of color, to gain some insight into what the future can hold. And to do so, I'd like to just um, describe three studies that we've conducted that can give us greater insight into the lived experience of students of color in academic medicine, in particular, how students are perceived, valued, and included in the learning environment. And to focus on how students were perceived, we decided we'd examine the language in the Medical Student Performance Evaluation Letter, also known as the Dean's Letter. We chose the Dean's Letter because the Dean's Letter is a structural component of every application for medical students to graduate medical education, and not only includes language from the Dean, but also language from that medical student's community, often from other medical students, residents, medical fellows, and also faculty. So we felt this letter could give a sense of how the medical and the academic learning center community views medical students. To do so, we took applications from 6,000 medical students applying to graduate medical education from 134 medical schools, applying to 16 different residency programs, all at one academic medical center being Yale. And again, our study cohort of 6,000 medical students closely mirrored all U.S. seniors nationally across a range of demographics. And in particular, when we looked at these letters of evaluation, we looked for the presence of specific words that had been used to examine letters of evaluation and recommendation in prior studies such as standout words such as best, excellent, outstanding, ability words such as intelligent, grindstone words such as hardworking, and words of compassion such as having empathy. And what we found was when we looked at the standout words, white medical students were significantly more likely to be described with these standout words such as exceptional, best, outstanding, and bright than students of color with the exception of the word competent, which was most likely to be used to describe black medical students. Although in particular, because of the, the word competent, we actually felt this was not necessarily a compliment, but actually a term of minimal assurance. We also saw differences based on gender, with women being significantly more likely than, their, um, than men to be described with words of compassion, such as caring and having empathy. So just from these dean's letters, again, a structural component of every um, application to graduate medical education, we can see that students were described differently based on aspects of their identity. We further wanted to gain insight into how students were valued in the Academic Medical Center. And to do so, we examined membership in the prestigious Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society. Uh, the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society, or AOA, has um, started in 1902 and boasts over 150,000 inductees, including 75% of all U.S. medical school deans, 50 Nobel Prize winners, and 11 of 19 surgeons general. In many cases, membership in AOA is considered to be the highest honor a medical student can achieve. Moreover, studies have shown that membership is associated with future success. Members of the Honor Society are more likely to go into academic medicine and obtain faculty positions, and also more likely to obtain the rank of dean, 
were likely to obtain the rank of professor and the rank of chair of the non-members. In terms of how members are selected, the National Honor Society sets guidelines. However, each individual medical school has significant discretion in terms of how members are chosen. Although the National Honor Society says that in a given medical school class, only 25% of medical students can be eligible for membership. And of those 25%, only 16% can ultimately be chosen. And the National Honor Society recommends that that 16% be chosen using holistic criteria such as leadership, community service, and also research. So again, we were very interested in how race and ethnicity was related to Honor Society membership. Again, using the same um, data set we had previously, we um, started with approximately 5,000 medical students in this case and removed all medical students coming from medical school without an AOA chapter and also medical students from historically black colleges because we felt that the selection criteria might be different in historically black medical schools compared to uh, primary white institutions and also removed all applications that where the medical student did not self-report race and ethnicity. And again, from this ARIS application or application to graduate medical education, we also, in addition to abstracting demographics such as race, ethnicity, age, and sex, we abstracted proxies for AOA selection, such as hours dedicated to leadership and community service, and additional variables that may influence honor society membership, such as the, the medical student having a dual degree, such as a master's or a PhD, and standardized step scores, such as USMLE step one scores, and also self-reported publications. And again, our, uh, the demographics of our study cohort were very similar to medical students nationally. And what we found was that AOA members had a significantly higher step one or standardized, te standardized test scores, but no difference in hours dedicated to leadership or hours dedicated to community service. Moreover, in our fully adjusted analysis, accounting for all the variables I described previously, including standardized test scores, um, Asian medical students and black medical students were significantly less likely to be members, with Asian medical students being almost half as likely as their white peers to be members, and black medical students being 80% less likely than their white peers to be members. And th again, this initial analysis was based on race ethnicity, but we, uh, we always wanted to go back and revisit AOA and see if we could see if there were other disparities based on other criteria. And I had the opportunity to um, work with a phenomenal medical student, uh, Miti and Nguyen, to actually explore also how socioeconomic status influenced uh, membership in the Honor Society. In particular, um, looking at childhood household income, whether or not the medical student was a Pell Grant recipient, and also whether or not the medical student had ever received federal financial aid. And to do so, we used a much larger data set from the AAMC, including about 30,000 medical students. And what we found um, in our basic analysis was that members of AOA were significantly less likely to be Pell Grant recipients, significantly less likely to have ever received federal uh, financial aid, and also less likely to be first-generation college graduates. Moreover, in our fully adjusted model, again, accounting for all the variables we described previously, when we looked at a very granular source of, uh, or measure for socioeconomic status, in this case being childhood household income, you can see an almost dose-dependent or stepwise response such that as medical students came from higher income families, they were significantly more likely to be members of the Honor Society, such that students from this lowest um, category of childhood household income were almost half as likely to be members than students from the highest um, category based on um, household income. Moreover, in this larger data set, we were also interested to see if the prior um, disparities based on race ethnicity were persistent. And in this larger data set, we saw that all students of color were less likely to be honor society members than white medical students. So not only were we able to see or from this data that perhaps bias and discrimination based on race and ethnicity play a role in honor society membership, but we can also see a dependence on socioeconomic status such that the disparities may not just exist in race ethnicity, but perhaps a more pervasive and um, sinister system of caste in the medical education as well. And these differences have not gone unnoticed. Um, this is just from an article from NPR that actually documented uh, Mount Sinai's own internal investigation of their Alpha Omega Honor Society. And they found over a five-year period, they'd inducted approximately 120 medical students into AOA. And of those 120 medical students, only five came from an underrepresented background. Um, since that time, Mount Sinai has actually suspended their AOA chapter. So again, you can see two studies so far showing how medical students are perceived and valued in the um, academic learning environment based on aspects of their identity. We ultimately also wanted to see how medical students were included. And to do so, we decided to do an exploratory analysis of the prevalence of microaggressions um, in medical school and also how those microaggressions influence student wellness and also medical school satisfaction. 
And I think we all have an understanding of what microaggressions are, but I did want to spend just a little bit of time showing some pictures from um, a program at Harvard known as I2M Harvard, where Harvard undergraduate medical students decided to get together and actually use illustration to kind of both demonstrate and report some of the microaggressions they commonly experience. So here you have this man um, listening to headphones saying, no, it's not rap. Or these women here with signs that say, you don't speak Spanish, or no, where are you really from? And these students here with, you don't look like a normal black person, you know? You're not like the other black people, I know, you speak so well. So while microaggressions have been well documented in higher education, less is known about the, presence, or the prevalence of microaggressions in medical education. So we decided to adapt a validated instrument for, the, um, for my, this presence of microaggressions known as the Racial and Ethnic Microaggression Scale and adapt in collaboration with um, several student organizations to better um, suit the climate of academic medicine. Again, to one, better understand the prevalence, but also understand how microaggressions influence student wellness. In this case, a screen for depression known as the Patient Healthcare Questionnaire 2, and also several questions about medical school satisfaction adapted from the business literature. Ultimately, our survey had about 14 questions, and just as a sample of some of the questions that were on the survey, People are surprised by how, how well I speak English. People mistake me for someone else who shares an aspect of my identity. People imply I was admitted to medical school for reasons other than academic merit. My ideas are ignored, but others are applauded when they say the same thing. If medical students endorsed any of um, these microaggressions, and again, in total we surveyed about 14, and reported them um, having experienced them more than a couple times a year, we would also ask that medical student why they felt that they experienced that microaggression. We had a range of possible sources of attribution, including gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, religion. And if the medical student didn't feel that the source of attribution was present, they could also um, write in why they felt they experienced it. And we ultimately sampled about 800 medical students, again, oversampling students of color. And again, surveying aspects of wellness, again, whether um, a positive screen for depression and also measures of medical school satisfaction. And what we found was that as we'd expect a priori, the, pre the prevalence of microaggressions was quite common, with about half of our study cohort reporting experiencing at least a microaggression at least once, once a week, and about 25% of students saying they experienced at least one microaggression almost daily. The sort dimensions of microaggressions were varied, ranging from gender, age, ancestry, skin color, weight, and religion. And again, just to give a little bit more context to what the microaggressions uh, that some of the medical students experience. A few medical students actually wrote in um, some of the particular microaggressions they experienced as well, and I just wanted to share a couple with you. So one student wrote, I had an older male physician as a first year mentor. I shadowed him every other week in his clinic for my intro clinical medicine required course. He would regularly introduce me to patients as a pretty face to talk to while you wait. Another student uh, wrote, I choose to wear my hair in its natural state sometimes. And one of the professors made a comment did you get electrocuted? After that comment was made, him and another professor proceeded to laugh. So again, we were interested in how these microaggressions influence wellness. And what we found was that when we actually stratified the frequency of microaggressions into um, quintiles, from the lowest quintile being the lowest frequency to uh, the fifth quintile being the highest frequency, again, in a very stepwise manner, as the frequency of microaggressions increase, medical students were significantly more likely to screen positive for depression, such that students in the highest quintile were almost seven times more likely than students in the lowest quintile. And in terms of medical school satisfaction, again, in a very exploratory analysis, we divided our cohort into just two groups. Um, one group, the 50% of students in our cohort that said they experienced microaggressions at least once a week, compared to the 50% that said they experienced microaggressions less frequently. Um, we labeled the group that experienced microaggressions at least once a week as the higher exposure group compared to the lower exposure group. And what we found was students in the higher exposure group were significantly less likely to say that they'd recommend their medical school to friends compared to students in the lower exposure group, were less likely to consider their current institution for graduate medical education or residency training, were less likely to say that they'd donate money to their medical school as a future alum, and significantly more likely to say that they've missed class in medical school, and also more likely to say that they've considered medical school transfer, and ultimately withdraw from medical school. So again, you can see that how students report a sense of inclusion in medical school, at least from our study, suggests that there are significant implications in the future divorce, diversity of the healthcare workforce. So again, I think that brings us to the current state. 
And while we have experienced significant gains, and I think we'll continue to experience those gains and more innovation that I think we'll talk, to, talk about more today um, during the rest of our conference, I think one key element that will challenge the gains we've experienced is the climate of equity and inclusion that we currently see in medical education. So thank you all for allowing me to speak today, and I'd love to take any questions. Yes, please. I know that two studies looked at the larger pipeline um, of, of elementary school. You can be a doctor when you grow up. Right. Uh, high school, you can be a doctor when you grow up. College, and that brings people into STEM um, later. Right. Uh, the separation from medical school, because I think a lot of this started a long time ago. Agreed. In, in our children's life. Agreed. And Yes, absolutely, and I think you're absolutely right. I think studies that have introduced the possibility of a career in medicine and also just giving additional knowledge in terms of how that career can be obtained, um, I, several studies have demonstrated benefit there. In fact, Dr. Talamantes has actually done some of those studies, if, if you'd like to comment on some of them as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.
And I go to it in the back, sorry. Right. No, thank you so much for the question. And again, just um, to summarize, the question wanted to know if there's any studies, any data currently looking at disparities based on race, ethnicity, or maybe other aspects of a student's identity in terms of their ability to match as well. And that's actually something we're just starting to look at. So is, is Miti and Wayne? In the, so Miti is actually doing a study on this right now if you want to just talk about some of the preliminary results. Thank you so much for that. So just as Miti is saying, we're seeing, again, disparities based on race, ethnicity, but a strong, perhaps, anti-man of color bias as well. That It's unclear why that exists, but I think we all have theories, but we'd need further ex ex exploration and investigation. Yes, please. We have yet to look at international medical graduates yet. Um, the data from the AAMC is a little bit more challenging with international medical graduates because th at least in terms of race, ethnicity, they don't collect that. We just know whether or not the student is as a US citizen or not, which makes the analysis a little bit more challenging because people can be from all over the world. And obviously, there, you know, some parts of the world might still have privilege versus other parts that don't. Um, but that is something we're further thinking about in ways that we can explore in a, in a rigorous way. I think the main thing I would say is, again, I think program directors want to train the best clinicians possible to give the best care for their patients. And I think the data shows that a diverse group gives you access to the best talent. And diversity is the only way they're going to know that they have the best clinicians to give the best patient care. Thank you so much. Thank you.